God bless you, Facebook and YouTube. How you doing? It's a Thursday afternoon, 5.30 on time. This is Robert Jenkins. God bless you. As always, me and my wife like to take out the time to say thank you for all of your commitment and loyalty. As always, we thank you for your thumbs up and your hearts. Please keep that going. It helps us and it helps, helps Facebook as well. I'm hearing something. It's like a TV on or something. Um, so we thank you for that. We bless you for that. And we just... It's Okay, we back. It is cloudy here in New Orleans, so we may have some interruptions. If we have too many of them, we'll just come back tomorrow. But as always, we take out the time to say thank you for your commitment and loyalty. Please share this teaching on your page. Please do that. As always, we ask you to tell people that we have a teaching five days out of a week, Monday through Friday. There is a word from the Lord. We're going to do a part four today, um, Raising Stars in the Kingdom, Raising Stars in the Kingdom. Jesus is the bright and morning star, but we also call the light of the world. And there is greatness in us. There is elevation in us. And I'm basically speaking to us, but as, but especially to the children, the children that God has put so much in. And we must know how to raise these stars, to raise these this prophetic generation. So as always, I take out the time. Me and my wife, we say thank you for your commitment and loyalty. I'm going to try my best to put some new videos on YouTube today. I try to make time for that, uh, but I know at least by the weekend there'll be some new ones on there. But you can always find us on YouTube, you can find us on Facebook, and you can find us on Instagram, okay? So I'm going to give you a couple more seconds um, so some more people to come on. We've basically been coming out of the scripture, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28, and also Psalms 1, verses 1 through 3, okay? So we've been coming out of that. Uh, basically talking about raising stars in the kingdom, how to raise your children to fulfill their potential in God. And it's so important that you start from the beginning and give them a strong foundation. Good to see you, Charles. God bless you. I'm looking for Trina to come on any minute. Youngstown, Cleveland, Warren, crew. We're just excited about all the people who's loyal. All right. I know Sister Perry will probably be coming on in a minute. All right, good to see you, Melissa. God bless you. Pray for you all the time. Hoping all is well. Don't give up on your dreams. Um, there's some things you shared that I'm praying for God to bring those to pass. So God bless you and stay on the journey. Waiting on some more people to come on. We're dealing with raising stars in the kingdom. Raising stars in the kingdom. God bless everybody. If you haven't had a chance to listen to part one, two, and three, please go back and get that. God bless everybody. God bless everybody. All right. God bless everybody. Yes, yes, yes. Please go back and watch uh, session one, two, and three. Very powerful sessions. If you have children, if God has put you, uh, given you a responsibility for children, just period. It's, it's just good information of how to be strong in the kingdom, how to be successful in the kingdom. These principles are across the board. If you apply them to your life, you, you'll see elevation. You'll see the glory of God. That's what we need. We need teaching. All right? All right, I'm not going to hold on too much longer. Um, just try to give time for people to come on. Good to see you. Good to see you. God bless everybody. God bless you. Good to see you, cousin. Ashley, God bless you. Good to see you. All right, good to see you, William. God bless you. God bless you. Seeing some great men of God and women of God coming on today. How to raise stars in the kingdom. There is a kingdom agenda, not only for us, but for our children. Our children. It's very important that we raise our children up to understand who they are in God and to walk according to their design. Don't, don't allow uh, children, you know, introduce them to purpose before you introduce them to pleasure. This is so important. If you understand purpose in life before you uh, learn pleasure, then pleasure won't become a distraction for purpose. Very important. Understand purpose first. Okay? Raising stars. Let me go there. Father, I thank you right now for your anointing. I thank you for your clarity of your word. We ask you to challenge us until we change. Lord, we ask you to also allow angels to be with us north, east, south, and west to guard our minds. God, bring us to a better understanding of who we, who you are and who we are. We bless you for all things, and we thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you didn't leave us to ourselves. 
So thank you for this particular teaching. Holy Ghost, we ask you and we invite you to have your way. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we praise God and we thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good to see you, Brother John John. God bless you, man. All right, all the way from Buffalo, New York. Good to see you. Good friend, good friend. Raising stars in the kingdom. Raising stars in the kingdom. Good to see you, Superintendent Tyrone. God bless you. God bless you. The first point I want to talk about here, if you haven't got a chance, please go back and see session one, two, and three so you can catch up. But the first point in part four I want to talk about that is very important that you, I told you that children are seeds and your job is to make sure they become trees. Your job is to make sure that they become trees. God speaks to Adam and Eve before they have a body, before they have eyes, noise, nose, intestines, kidneys. He speaks to them and he says, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. That's in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God does inform man in chapter 2, verse 7. So their assignment came from a spiritual place, not a natural place. And all children must be able to hear the voice of God from a spiritual place and not a natural place. That's, that's so important to their destiny. Good to see you, Zebedee. God bless you. So that's so important. Children have to hear certain things that you can, you have the DNA in your father, which is God. You have the DNA to be fruitful, to multiply, replenish, not seedful, but fruitful. Fruitful is the conclusion of seedful. God wouldn't tell you to be fruitful if you weren't full of seeds. That's unlimited potential. Children must know this, but also children must know this. Children must know what you see in them and you must keep watering them until what you see in them, they are convinced that they see it as well. Our children need to know what we see in them. This is the model that you establish for your kids. So you have to have a vision for your children in order for you to tell them, I know what I see in you. And you keep watering them and training them and cultivate them until what you see, they see as well. And there's agreement in, 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 in their spirit that what mama saw, I finally see for myself. Okay? The children have to hold on to what you see. My mother saw things in me way before I saw them. And she helped me along the way. She would have provide equipment for me. I was a musician and still am. She provided equipment for me because she saw something for me and she saw it in me and she knew that it was God given. Children must understand that mama sees something and I'm going to trust mama as if I trust mama for food and for shelter. I'm going to trust mama for clarity for my purpose and as I get older I should see what mama saw. It's called the seesaw principle. You got to see what your mother and father saw or somebody in your life saw. That's why it's so important to have prophetic mentors in your life and wise coaches in your life so that your children can say, you know what? I finally see what mama saw. Mama is given an instinct. She is given a prophetic understanding to see things about us. And it's so important. If you read uh, Genesis chapter 49, you'll see where Jacob saw some things in his son and he spoke some blessings lessons in his son, and some of them was a good, and some of them were bad, but he saw some things in his children. You want to be able to bring out the positive in your children and tell them that one day you will see what I see, but most of the time we don't see anything positive for our kids. So our kids growing up leaning on someone else, another system, because they didn't have anything to look at because you didn't show them what you saw. Uh-oh, uh, Eve fell in the garden because of her imagination. The Bible says she saw the tree to be one wise. Before she tasted it, she saw it. Uh-oh, and she saw it to the point that her imagination even knew what it would do to her once she tasted. This is a prophetic understanding that we should have, and the devil tries to tap into the imagination of a man and pervert you. But you need somebody positive that say, I know what I see. Oh, I know what I see, and I'm convinced. Vince, and I'm going to put you on a path. I'm going to love you. I'm going to cultivate you. I'm going to train you until you see what I see in yourself. Every child need to know that their mother and father see something great in me. My mother see leadership in me. My father see responsibility in me. They see kingship in me. And this is necessary because you are the eyes for the children until they grow and mature and have eyes on their own. I remember my mother and father going through a divorce. And I remember hating my dad because my mother told me so much negative about my father. And I began to take on my mother's hate for my dad because I was young enough to be cultivated by her eyes and by her ears. But I remember my dad coming over one day to pay child support and he says, one day, son, you'll get old enough and you'll see it out of your own eyes. Uh-oh. 
Uh oh. Now, that's a positive and a negative. Because there were some things going on negative in my life or in my mother's life, I was able to see what my mother saw about my dad through her eyes. And as I got older, I realized mama wasn't the perfect one either. But the purpose of it is, that's the negative side. But the positive side is it that we need parents that see something in our children. And this is why I'm giving you the best education. This is because this is why I'm taking you to church. This is why I'm buying you this $300 or $400 equipment. Or this is why I'm putting you in this kind of school. Or this is why I'm letting you meet this kind of person. Because I see something in you. And it's an honor when the child knows that even though I may not see it, mama see it. And I trust and believe it. And one day it is, it is a compliment. It is an honor to be able to know that the child shall see what you see in them. Now, this is positive and negative. If you see them as no good, they may be raised up to believe about themselves based upon how you treated them or what you prophesied over them. But the best way to raise up stars in the kingdom is to give them a positive outlook, a positive outlook on what God showed you about the thing that come out your womb or the person who is coming out your womb. Okay, so important. That's point number one. Point number two, you must teach your children. Now, when I'm talking about raising stars in the kingdom, I'm talking about raising up gifted, called, sanctified children that God has blessed you. Children are the inheritance of the Lord and you raising them up in the kingdom. I use the word stars because Jesus is the bright morning star. And we must understand that whenever God puts us in the vicinity of a child, they are stars and do not uh, damage them or tarnish them or pervert them because you can't see. Okay, very key. All right. So first point is so important. This is why I pray every day for children to have the proper guidance over their life. Because who eyes are you looking through? Okay, it's not always what you're looking at. It's what you're looking through. If you have on blue contacts, you're going to see things blue because you're looking through a blue lens. So a lot of times our children don't even get a chance to see the greatness in them because we give them a, a lens called pain or rejection or sorrow or you're no good like your dad or you, you're not that you're not that smart or you're dumb or you don't understand. And they never got a chance to grow up in a house where mama saw something positive about me. I feel the Holy Ghost. Mama saw, mama saw me coming out of college. Mama saw me owning my own business. Daddy saw me uh, working uh, hard and being able to take care of my family. I know I can do this because I know my mother and father, what they saw and what God showed them was not inadequate. It was not. It was not. Uh, it was accurate. It was clear. And I believe that. And now I am convinced every day of my life, I think about my mind runs so fast. I think about so many things that my mother told me that I see now for myself. She believed in me. She believed in me. How are you going to raise stars when the parents don't even believe he's going to be successful? When the parents don't even believe that he can finish college? When the parents don't even believe that she's qualified? When, when those who are connected to you don't even believe in your greatness? You need to be able to raise your children up to this is how you raise stars that one day you will see what I see. I remember uh, when I was young and I was playing drums. I told the story before and I'll tell it again. And my mother would let me practice drums from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. I would get home from school about 2.30. I had from 2.30 to 4 o'clock to do my chores. You know, we do upstairs. I do upstairs. My brother do downstairs. Or I do downstairs. He do upstairs. I run the sweeper and dust. He wash dishes. The children don't even have that anymore. We had a responsibility from 2.30 to 4 o'clock. After my everything was done by 4 o'clock and homework was, was done as well, I could practice my drums from 4 to 8. Uh, one time my mother had company and I was downstairs playing the drums. And drums are very loud and very noisy. And I remember the lady saying, come on, Pat, can you tell him to stop playing that noise? It's so loud. How do you deal with all that noise? And I remember hearing my mother say to her, I will deal with the noise until it becomes sound. I'm going to tolerate the noise until it becomes sound. She saw that my noise could become sound. You need people in your life that can see and hear your noise and know that one day it will not always be noise. 
Are you hearing me? Somebody has to see that you're intelligent. Somebody has to see that you are very witty. Somebody has to see it. And, it's, and, you, and that's necessary that you lean on that person until you become convinced that what they saw in the positive is true. Very key. Point number two in how you raise stars. You must teach them, and this is for teenagers, teach them how to start what they want to see. When I was going to school and going to college, there were a lot of young men and young women who were sold out for God. And they would go to college and they would they would notice that there wasn't a strong Bible uh, study. There wasn't a strong Bible uh, uh, community. There wasn't a, a lot of programs for, for Christians. And these young men and these young women would start their own Bible study. And I'm telling you, it, it, it took off like wildfire. You got to tell your young stars, you may not see yourself in your school, but what you know that is in your spirit, man, I feel the Holy Ghost today. What you know that is in your spirit, if you don't see it, then start it. Don't wait for somebody else to come along. Don't fuss that that is not, it's not in the agenda. It's not on the program. Then maybe God has left space for you. And you got to tell your children that. Daddy, they don't have a soccer team at the place. Then start the soccer team. A lot of times the church is limited to just a building. And we're not, and we have not expanded to become the city that God called us to. Because we don't know how to start what we need. We're looking for everybody else to start what's, what's on your heart. How do you know you have purpose and passion for something? by what bothers you. If it bothers you that there's nobody dealing with the young people, then you should be starting uh, dealing with the young people. Start in your living room. Start in your basement. This is essential. So we have to teach stars that there are a lot of things that God called you to do that God has left space for you to do it. And you're not going to see it until you begin. And you got to understand why these things are on your heart. Why these things burden you down. Why these things bring tears to your eye. Why they bother you that children don't have have house shoes or why do it bother you the young men don't have proper education whatever the case may be whether it's a school whether it's a bank whether it's a hospital regardless of what it is you got to tell your young people if you don't see it in your church begin it you start the new organization you start the committee you start the prayer at midnight when I was living in Youngstown Ohio I had a watchman on the wall because it bothered me the people were being shot at midnight bars was open at midnight hospitals open at midnight and and it bothered me that people wouldn't step out. So I started my own radio station, got on the radio, and I prayed from midnight to one o'clock in the morning, a solid prayer on the radio station, not playing music. I prayed for one solid hour, and I started, and I called it Watchmen on the Wall, and I had a radio station, and, and, and God blessed me and gave me favor with this radio station. People began to pay for me to have time that I was on the radio station from midnight to six in the morning, and I would pray for one solid an hour, and I had a, I had a, a contact with the hospitals, with the police department, with the fire department, with the ambulance, and they would come by and let me know an accident just happened, or give me a phone call, just just happened, and we would go into prayer. I started that. There's so many things that God put in my spirit that I started. I remember when God put on my spirit to do a love CD, and I did a love CD about 15 years ago. It was called The Truth About Love, and I did the whole thing on on Corinthians and deal with how to love your wife and all of that because. God God had put it in my spirit. You got to know how to start what God put in your spirit. And parents, you got to tell your children the things that you are called to do that you're not going to see in your community. You're not going to see in your church. You're not going to see in your school. But you are the one that's going to make the difference. You start this program. You start out lending money. I remember watching Oprah one day and this one uh, lady and her daughter was concerned about children not having pajamas. And she wanted people to have pajamas. And before you know it, people were sending pajamas all over the place. She had to get a warehouse and she began to hiring people and actually created income to give people pajamas because there was a need. We got to teach our children. You are the business owner. You're going to start things. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost. You may open up the first restaurant. You may start the first uh, save and sanctified donut shop, whatever it may be. And you got to understand that God is calling you and you have to start it. And you have to have enough courage. You got to tell your children, you can do this. Mama will invest. Daddy will back you up. Pastor will be there for you because a lot of things that God is putting on your heart, you're not going to have to wait for others. You are going to be the engine that start. Uh-oh. 
You got to start what you feel is lacking in the world. What's lacking in the world? You say we don't have enough mentors. We don't have enough classes for the children to have uh, bad grades. Then start it. We don't have enough computers. Then start it. How did you think Salvation Army got started? Because it was laid on somebody's heart. How do you think these large entities got started? Because they laid on somebody's heart. We got to teach our children that you are going to be the one and you may have to go by yourself. In the first year, nobody supports you. You may seem like you're lonely. may seem like you don't have the right support, but stay with it and God will faithfully allow it to manifest. You got to start what you're needing to see. You want to see a youth department? You want to see a youth choir? You got to start it. You got to start. There's so many things that are in our stars, but because they don't see another organization, they don't see nobody else doing it. They have given up on their dreams because they waiting to join with somebody. But somebody else said, if you started, I'll come and join in with you. You may be the leader and we have to tell our children, it's okay. You don't have to join everything. Some things, you are the beginning. And sometimes when you know you're the beginning, sometimes you have to be alone in order to be the first. You have to learn to be alone. The first person that started anything, because they was the first, they was alone. And you have to tell your children, it's okay to be alone on this venture. And not even your children, you yourself. You keep looking around and wondering, where is this at? Where is this at? Then start it yourself. And watch God back you up. Matter of fact, if you do what God tells you in your spirit, the universe will bring it to you. The creation will bring it to you, but you got to start it. You got to teach your children to start what they feel is lacking in the world. Your children are here to solve a problem. Every seed that is born is born to solve a problem. But you may be the first. Uh, who was the first to got on MySpace? And then we have Facebook and then we have all these other things. But somebody had to step out. Somebody had to step out. What's in you that's waiting on you to step out? And you have to teach your children. It's okay to step out. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to seem to be fearful, but step out by faith. Are you hearing me? God is doing something today. He's breaking yokes as I'm speaking. The next thing you have to teach your children when you're raising stars, that life is their stage. Life is their stage. You have to tell your children that. You have to tell them that there is room in life. When I was growing up in church, I couldn't see myself in a lot of areas that God gave me. I have the ability to write songs. I have the ability to write poetry. I can play drums. I can play piano. I can hear almost every instrument there is. I can put a song together and put bass, strings, violin, guitar, tubas. I hear it. I, one of the things that I'm, I'm upset because church has become culture. Either, either Most people go to a black church if you're black or you go to a white church if you're white. But I hear all sounds. I hear all sounds, but we don't know how to use all sounds, the stages of life for worship, but we'll never be able to have a, a rainbow church, which, and that's really what God is calling for. Joseph had a coat of many colors. Oh, real sound is in all colors. If you know anything about sound, it's in colors. It's in colors, but we have to learn to use that. The stage, the world is our stage, everything that God given you. But I couldn't find stage in church because there's some songs that God given me that's not really uh, applicable to Sunday mornings, but they are applicable to the, to the men and women of God. See, but because I couldn't find myself, I gave up on a lot of things. And a lot of things I delayed for a long time because I don't know where, where it was supposed to go. God had given me visions of going to the ice skating ring and they were ice skating under worship. And can you imagine watching people ice skating, or worship, doing worship, uh, whether it's uh, Travis Green or doing worship by Tasha Cobbs on the, on the skating ring. So I believe that the glory of God will, will complete the earth when we use the world as our stage. Jesus died died on the outside. He fed on the outside. He healed on the outside. We want to do too many things in the building. We have to teach our children, do not limit what God given you to the building. You, the stage, the, the world is your stage. God is going to use you. You're not just called to the congregation. You're called to the nations, to the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Go into all the nations. There's some giftings that that's necessary. It's not needed for Sunday morning, but it, it, but it is needed for Thursday afternoon. 
Come on, somebody. And we need all of these ventures in God. The stage is. And so what happens is when we don't look at the world as our stage to display the glory of God, then we lose people from the local church. We lose them because if I'm a comedian, I don't know how to feed my family on telling jokes on Sunday mornings. I can't tell jokes on Sunday morning. If I'm a tap dancer and God has given me the gift to tap dance, where do I tap dance at? What choir is going to let me tap dance along with them? Now, do I have to tap dance in the world and I'm saved and sanctified and I thank God for saving me from my sins and redeeming me, but I'm limited because we only can do a certain amount of things in the building. But if we became the earth is the Lord's and the food is thereof and understand that we are city set on a hill, we should be owning our own malls, our own skating rings, our own bowling alley. Come on, somebody. See, this is so so deep, and I'm sorry that your reception is messing up, but we should have our own skating ring. The other day, I took me and my wife, we took our children to the skating ring, and it was all gospel music, and it was a pleasure to watch them out there skating to gospel music. Yeah, blessing God, and I'm praying for the power of God to touch a person's heart. Because, but that's real because just because you love to skate don't mean that you have to be subject to the world. I stopped skating because of the music that they was playing. I didn't want to be out there. No, I love God with all my heart. Understand my anointing. I can't be out there skating to Funkadelics. I can't be out there skating uh, to more bounce to the ounce. No, not me. Uh, I know what I'm called. And I understand the signature that's on my life. But we need to have our own skating rings. So to tell children that what God has given you is bigger than the four walls of the church. And you go on your own skating ring and your own bowling alley and your own baseball team and your own football team. I remember growing up in Youngstown, Ohio, Dr. Wagner, who passed on now, he had his own football team. The church had their own football team and it was called the Sons of Thunder and they learned Bible class and they learned how to pray. Come on, somebody, because he used his, the world as the stage. Everybody is not a preacher. Everybody's not a teacher. Everybody's not praise and worship. And you shouldn't be limited to be able to express the glory of God when God raised you up to be a star because, because you don't preach and you don't teach and you don't play the organ, you don't play the drums. Oh, well, I guess you got to go to the world. No, we need tuba players. We need saxophone players. We need people who do tap dancing. We need people who do arc work. We need those who know how to do flowers. We need those who know how to cook food. We need those who know how to sell shoes. We should have our own shoe ring. Uh, a line, an own clothing line. Come on, Puff Daddy can have his own clothing line. People have their own commercials, have their own cereal. And here we are, the salt of the earth, the salt of the earth. We are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, but we limit it to just singing the same old songs, shouting, speaking in tongues. That's all it is to what God has given us. No, the stage is your world. And I'm telling you, when we have, when we have learned to advance outside of the four walls of the church and begin to, to promote and support the stars that God has given us to rise up, they're going to introduce us to another uh, arena that we don't have to say, I'm bored, what are we doing? Most, most Christians wait on Sunday to be excited. Can't wait for Sunday. Can't wait for Sunday. We ain't got nothing to do on Fridays and Saturdays. How do you leave the world with the devil? You party all night Friday, all night Saturday, drink yourself to death. Now you gain yourself over to God, submitted yourself into the will of God, and now when you get saved, you're boring on Friday nights because we don't have our own skating ring, our own restaurants, our own malls, but then we want to preach we are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Well, I don't see nothing but a building and a bus that don't work. No, we got to understand that the world is the stage. The world, and we're supposed to introduce the world to the goodness of God, to the glory of God, and we can show them how to do this right. We should have our own barber shops, our own hairdressers, come on, our own restaurants. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost here. And we have to tell our children what God has given you. You don't have to be subject just to use it on Sunday morning. You may never use it on Sunday morning, but you're called to make a difference in the earth and what God has given you. And you can't let, there's so many people who can't find themselves because they say, well, I know I'm not an apostle, I'm not a prophet, I'm not a evangelist, I'm not, not a pastor, I'm not a teacher, I guess I'm just a sheep. And they don't know what they called to be because we got this five little thing that we hold everybody to, or unless you're a musician, we hold everything to. But what happens if you know how to draw? What happens if you're good with children? What happens if you good with money? Come on, talk to me, somebody. Everything you see in the world, you should see. We need lifeguards that love Jesus. 
all that can be going. We have our own pools, and you can take your children off. When I was growing up, my mother had to go back and get her GED. She was working and trying to get her GED. Oh, talk to me, somebody. Trying to go back to chauffeur. She went to chauffeur in Youngstown, Ohio, and they dropped us off at the boys club. Thank God for the boys club. It was at the boys club that I learned how to play bumper pool and pool and wood shop and basketball, and they learned, and I was in a chess competition and a checker competition because of boys club, but we ought to have a young men's club. Oh, oh, where well, young men can be dropped off and the mentors are saved and loving them because what you have, we must prepare you to display it to the world. Look what God has given this young man. Look what God has given this young lady. And she don't have to preach. She don't have to be forced into a calling that is not her calling. So now she call herself a minister. No, you're not called to preach. You're called, you're called to be a counselor. You're called to be a mentor. But because we're limited. Are you hearing me? We're limited. And you got to teach our children. Raise up stars. I know so many people who have so many giftings, but I, but but, but where, where does that fit in church? And and then we don't even believe that 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 gift that God has given them will take care of their family. So we'll make people go get a job when God gave them a career. We'll make people go get a job that God has given them the career. God has given them a career, a lifetime career, not, not a job just to be able to serve somebody else to pay bills when 85% of your money is going to bills. You're not working for your family. You're working for the banks. You're working for the house department. You're working for electric and gas. See, but God is trying to teach us how to raise up children that if they do what they've been called to do and have been equipped to do, they'll be able to be able to leave inheritance for their children. But you can't do it in the small little four walls of your church. You can't have 30 ministers at a church. How many times are you going to let him preach? It's 30 of us. The pastor preaches every Sunday. You waiting, you waiting around every second Sunday one young minister preach. It's 30 of them. Well, it's April 12 months in a year, so you got a year and a half before you get a chance to speak. Because we don't know how to make the world your platform. But there's somebody on the corner who needs that word you have. There's somebody, there's somebody at the bus stop that needs that word you have. You have to make the world your stage and tell your children that. Let's go down to the bus stop. Let's talk to some people. Let's go visit the homeless. Let's go talk to some people. Oh, you, 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 you drawing all over. The, you got great artwork. Let's show the artwork to the world of what God can do. We should have our own artwork and paintings. That we don't have to buy from the world and from the commercial to put uh, decorations in the church or in your home. You should have people who have their own drift stores. Me and my wife, we love to go through the uh, thrift stores. But we should have our own. All the stuff that we have. But you know why? We don't believe the world is our stage. This is how you raise stars. The world is your stage. And everything that God has given you is to be displayed so that God can get the glory out of it. We should own more property than anybody. We've been given land. The first thing that God promised us was the promised land. Flowing with milk and honey. The, 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 the apostles was business owners. Peter had his own fishing business. Talk to me. Matthew was a tax collector. These, these were entrepreneurs. People who own their own business. And then they know how to do it. They went out to the world and fish. See, this is real talk. And you have to expand your children's mind. Or they'll be lost in church wondering, where do I fit in, mama? I don't do that. So now you're making people be preachers who are not preachers. You're making people do things that they're not called to do because the stage is too small. See? And that goes from everything. I remember when MC Hammer first came out and he was dancing. And then he gave his life to God. He didn't know how to make that transition. Because when he made transition to go to gospel, his sales drop. Because we don't support one another. That's another thing. You got to get behind these ideas. You got to get behind one another. When God has raised you up a star with the teaching that I will support you. I will be behind that. Kids should have their own lemonade state, uh, stand. Kids should have their own hot dog stands. And, and whatever the case may be, have their own tent. Kids should be able to talk to have their own lawn business, cutting grass. I was I was going in, in I, I was raised in the projects 
And, and every Saturday, my grandmother told me to go knock on other senior citizens' door and take their trash out, and that's when they had dumpsters. And I would take a little trash can and pour it in the dumpster, come back to the house, and she'd give me a nickel. I come back to my grandmother's house an hour and a half later, I got $7 in my pocket. Well, that, that was, $7 was a lot to me. I'm talking about in 1970. I'm seven years old, but I'm learning how to make money. I'm learning how to have a business. Because the world is our stage. I can't wait to get older and start teaching and preaching in church. There's business ideas in the kids now. The creativity is in the children now. But we got to tell them when they go to church, you may not see yourself here, but God has a place for you. And you don't have to compromise to the world. This is how we lose singers and entertainers and business owners because they don't know how to still stay in God in sanctification and this and, and express their gift. And because of the environment of the world, next thing you know, you got contaminated because you went around the right people. I told you yesterday, we should have a city called the city of God, where you go there and everything you need for a regular household to get in groceries, to get in your car fixed, to get in your hair done, to buying clothes should be owned by the saints. How do we have a, a Walmart and don't have a church mark? Walmart is bringing everything together. You can buy bikes at Walmart. You can get groceries at Walmart. You can go to Subway, go to McDonald's at Walmart. You can get uh, uh, you can get lawn equipment at Walmart. Why don't we have that? Because the ideas first come to the salt. Every idea first comes to the kingdom. But because we don't know how to make the world our stage, we suffocate it, we suppress it, and before you know it, we only believe in a couple things. Oh, God. Help us, Lord Jesus. I hope I'm blessing you. Next thing we have to teach our young people, that God may give you favor, God may give you school, and God may give you work. You have to know that every child is not going to come out of college. Don't force every child to be educational. Find out what is on their life, the anointing on their life. Cause them to be in prayer, supplication, be thankful, and teach them to know where the wind is blowing for their life. Some people, God is going to have favor on your life. And what school does for someone else, favor is going to do for you. I was able to start playing drums for a lady and out of Warren, Ohio, by the name of Debbie Austin. Debbie Austin was a singer for James Cleveland. And she used to sing her and another lady called Gwen Morgan uh, out of Warren, Ohio for the caravans. It's way back in the day. But what happened was I was at a church uh, at that time, Mount Zion Baptist Church. That's where I was licensed at. And my father in the ministry was Reverend C. Ricardo Walker. He passed on now. And he invited Debbie Austin, where she was a friend of, of, of his, to come and sing. And because I was at the church service, and when she came to sing, I noticed that she had singers and a piano player, but she didn't have a drummer. So I asked her, after the service is over, you don't have a drummer. I play drums. Uh, you know Pastor Walker, he's a good friend of yours, of yours. He's my father in the ministry. Uh, can I audition for you? She said, Well, I'm looking for drummers. Come that Saturday and audition. Well, I came that Saturday and audition, and that following week I was going out of town being Debbie Austin's drummer. And it was from that being in the right place, being in the right place at the right time. God allowed the favor to come in my life. And next thing you know, I'm playing drums for James Cleveland and Charles Fold and Vicky Winans. And I'm meeting all these gospel entertainers, Vanessa Bell Armstrong, the Winans, all these different people who were coming up in that time because I had favor on my life. Now, somebody else may have to go to college and come out with a degree and go to an academy of school or go to all that. I didn't go to that, but God gave me favor. I didn't know how to read music at that time, but later on in life, I went back and got some drum lessons and learn how to read music, but favor was on my life. You got to tell your child that God may give you favor. Now, this doesn't mean to talk against school or talk against education, but sometimes God has favor on your life and you never know how that favor is going to run, okay? It's the same thing with Joseph. Joseph had a dream that he's going to be higher than his brothers and his sisters, and even higher than his mother and his father. When he found himself in a pit, he found himself in a prison, but next thing he had favor on his life because he interpreted a dream, uh-oh, and when the king needed somebody spiritual, he, they was, he, was, he, he was heard about, and he called him up, and then he was elevated out of favor. 
out of favor. So you have to tell your children that favor could be on your life. And you can go from one place to another place in a matter of seconds. You can be broke today and rich tomorrow by the favor that's on your life. You can go from nobody knowing you to the whole world knowing you overnight. You don't really get any bigger. Your exposure does. People say, well, where, are you famous? I've always been famous. I have not been discovered. Uh-oh, I know who I am in God. I know who I am in God. But God's favor will elevate you. Okay? Paul was a, Saul, I would say Saul before he was Paul, was a a killer of Christians. He was a killer of Christians. So when he came into uh, being saved, uh, uh, no one wanted to trust uh, uh, Saul as Paul. Oh, his greatest revelation yet, nobody wanted to trust him. But God gave him favor with Barnabas. And Barnabas gave him credibility. You never know. God may connect you to somebody who will give you favor and move you five steps ahead of the person who working hard. Now, that's not against work and it's not against education. You must know the favor that is on your life and tell your child who may be knocking his head, trying to get good grades, having a hard time, trying to make things work. Well, we got to see what God is saying for you because everybody, God ain't saying college for everybody and God ain't always saying favor for everybody. Sometimes God may have you have a work ethic. Uh oh, and you go to school and you get good grades and you apply yourself and God, again, by the grace of God, open up doors through that way. But don't limit favor and don't limit work and don't limit, what's the last one? School. Okay? Very key. And you must tell your children that because sometimes children feel in, in, incompetent because they can't pass. This is very hard. Most times you raise up in the black school system uh, or low income school system that, that you're not properly trained anyway. You're not getting all that you need most of the time. And that's not against those teachers who are teaching. A lot of times we don't have the funding that we need because we as parents don't stand behind proper education. It's so expensive to go to college now. Uh oh, if you don't have the right support, but you never know the journey God going to take you down. There are so many people that went a different journey. So you tell your child, I don't know what journey you're going to. You may go down through the, through the Joseph journey. I don't know. You may go through the Moses journey. Moses' mother had to give him up. Uh oh, give him up at birth because there was a decree to kill all the children. But the very thing she released, God brought back to her. You never know. God may have to let you let some things go. And sometimes you have to have a temporary loss in order to have a permanent gain. But you have to tell Tell your children that favor can be on your life. And when favor is on your life, connection is on your life. And when there's connection, uh oh, there's a connection that God will connect you to the right people at the right time that will take you to the place you need to go. But then sometimes God will have you go through the education. Woo! God. And you have to work and you have to learn. I've worked for many, many years of my life. I remember starting working in OWE program when I was in, in high school. I'll go to school half a day and I work half a day. And I remember that favor was on my life and God gave me favor with a job. Oh, you never know who you're going to meet. You never know who you're going to be connected to. Sometimes you need to be in a job because your job is going to introduce you to favor. Sometimes you need to be in school because school is going to introduce you to a job who the job is going to introduce you to favor. However, you have to know the the, the, the wind is blowing for your life. Uh, I remember about 10, 15 years ago, and I may not be accurate on the actual dates, but more more millionaires came off of Russell Simmons' uh, Def Jam comedy. And all of a sudden, new actors came out of Def Jam comedy, from Kevin Hart to Eddie Murphy to Chris Tucker. I mean, you go on and on and on. He kept producing stars. These were comedians who just came to uh, audition for Def Jam comedy. Next thing you know, they're doing movies. Next thing you know, they being exposed because you never know the favorites on your life. Don't tell me that the demonic side knows how to elevate those people and the light side doesn't have elevation for you. You got to tell your child, but you don't know. So you keep working in the vein God has you in until the doors are open. There's different type of favor. Some doors you can step into, and the minute you step on to, step on there uh, uh, in a close vicinity, the doors open automatically. There are other doors you got to push with some effort. You got to know which one God has you in. Some of you got to push the doors open. Other people, you step on it, and as soon as you step on it, the doors automatically open. Uh oh. So you have to understand and tell your children that. So because you don't want them feeling bad when they don't do well in school. You don't want them feeling bad as if I, I, I used to work for Wendy's and I was a supervisor at Wendy's. And I had people who were working for me and I didn't have a degree. 
I didn't have a degree. Sent, Wendy sent me to school, but they were working for me and they had a master's degree. You never know the journey God has you on. So you have to tell your children that so that they won't be in, uh, they won't be so feel so discredited or their dreams, uh, life becomes a dream killer to them because their expectation and they didn't know what God was going to do, but you never know. And from that, God began to bless. So there's favor and there is school. There's a, you know, you study the Bible, they had a school of prophets. So you can't get, get it, can't go against education. Okay. And then their work ethics, the, the apostles, they work, they work, but they work their own business. You have to tell your children that and put that in, to, in them. Don't make them think that the world controls their destiny. God controls your destiny. When man says yes, God may say no. And when man says no, God may say yes. God will give you favor. Listen, I've had houses given to me and I've given away houses. I've had cars given to me and I've given away cars. I'm telling you, you never know. Okay? Very key. So I want you to teach your children that. Favor. School and work is how the wind is blowing. Okay, we got 14 minutes. Another thing I want to talk about when you're raising stars, and this may seem carnal, but it goes so deep. I can probably write a book on this next issue. I probably can write two or three books. You need to be very careful with your name and your children. When you're raising stars in the kingdom, be very careful of the name that you're giving them. Listen, Every name, there's a spirit that's attached to every name. The word name really means, in etymology of the word, it really means nature, the nature of something. And whenever you give a person a name, you're also giving them the mindset or the consciousness or in those who are spiritual or those who have a relationship with God, we call it a spirit. There's a spirit behind a name. So even when it comes to Jesus, by no other name can a man be saved, but by the name of Jesus. Now it's, it's bigger than the J-U-S-U-S. -S. It's dealing with by no other nature can a man be saved. Jesus' name has authority because of how he lives. Okay? So demons are attached to the lifestyle. And when you give a name, you give a consciousness. So when you name your children certain thing, a consciousness goes along with them. Whether they know it or don't know it, the consciousness is still there. You'll notice that most people will change your name according to your behavior. So if you're a person that's been wild and crazy and you've been hurting people, you know, I grew up with people and they called him killer. Well, they called him killer because that was the mindset they have that if you mess with him, he'll kill you. And he had proven that before, so they give him the mind killer. There's another friend of mine that was raised up and he was very dark, so they called him smoke. Because he's very dark and then he tent windows, so they call him smoke. Okay, but there's a mindset to come along with smoke. Okay, now his real name was different. And sometimes you can know your name and you can know your name. Okay, and a lot of times we naming these children, the very thing you naming them is fighting their destiny. The name you get, have given them from the earthly realm is tied to an earthly law. They're names that are tied to an earthly law. There's a reason why his name is, is Slick. They call him Slick because he's been slick all his life. See, there's a reason why. And there's a conscience to go along with that. So sometimes destiny fights you because of a name that's against you. You show me any name of church and I guarantee you that church is fighting for the very integrity of their name. If church is called Holy Temple, hardly nobody in that temple holy. Because it's not because nobody wants to live holy in their temple. It's because the devil will fight you on the name. So you to be very careful. That's why you can't name churches after people. Because this is not your church. So when you call that church by your name, now it is your nature that is running that church. See, this has happened. And it happens to people. It happened to Jacob. They named him Jacob. Jacob means trickster. So guess what he's doing? He's still in birthrights. He's still in blessings. His mother helping him con his father. He dressing up looking like his brother because his name is trickster. So what the first thing God does when he, when he wrestles with him? He changes his name. Why does God need to change your name in the Bible? Because there is a mindset that's attached to your name. So we name all these kids, all these crazy names, and most of the time we don't even know the meaning behind it. A lot of times there's Buddhists behind it, there's witchcraft behind it, there's a warlock spirit behind it, uh, there's a generational curse applied to it. Uh-oh, all these names and we don't know it. And now your children come out trying to fight for their destiny. Even when they're young, they don't even know who they are, but something is wrestling with them because you gave them a name. Where does Shaniqua come from? And I'm not going against names. I'm saying understand. 
In the old days, they would wait for a while and watch the baby's character. And then they would watch and see and wait for discernment and wait for the spirit to reveal who this child is supposed to represent so they can name him so he can live in his name. This is why if you study African American, one of the reasons why people who are into uh, black power and stuff like that, and I'm, I'm really not into it, but people who are into it, they're, they're very uh, upset about them changing our names because at one time our names meant something. When you said the name Medulla, it means man of power or man of courage. So you were trying to live according to your name. Oh, See, but we didn't get away from that. So we became Americanized and American names. And these spirits are attached to it. So you have to be very careful. Why? Because you don't want to start a war with your child. Even before they get a chance to even know who they are, they're already fighting with a name you gave them. See? Not because it sounds good. You want to spell it different. You want to be different. You want to be unique. Even me and my wife, when we get dogs, and, we, and you know, my wife loves dogs more than I do, but... So we try to study the dog. We say, well, let's name her that. No, she don't look like that. No, let's name him that. No, he don't look like that. And then a couple of dogs we named, we, we kind of regret we named them because they lived out their name. My, my wife loved that movie, Marley and Me, and the dog was destructive and, and tore the whole house up. So we got a nice pit. It was half pit and half lap, and we named it Marley, and it lived out the name. It was destructive, tore up my wife's garden, just tore up the backyard, because you know what? You named it Marley. There's a consciousness to go along with that. So a lot of times the destiny is being arrested. So God said, I got to change your name from Simon to Peter. Change your name from Saul to Paul. Same time your name from Abram to Abraham because there's destiny on your life and your name has to match your destiny. A lot of times we ruin how to raise stars because you're raising that name you gave them. And the world will give them a name. Killer, smoke, slick, quick, ladder. Whatever the case may be, black, you know, all these names, and they can be depressive. Or they can help, they, what they do, they create a, a maze, and it's hard for you to get out the maze, because you don't even know there's a consciousness that's making you be who you're not. It's making you wear a mask, that you're not a killer, but you, but you can't get past the spirit of the conscious behind a name. That's so why I was telling you about tattoos. Let your kids have tattoos. Let your kids have earrings. There's consciousness. If I walk up to a bar and I have a Bible in my hand, I don't have to say I'm a Christian. That Bible is going to give a signal because the Bible is attached to something. A cross is attached to something. Automatically, everything you carry everything, is a symbol. A hand sign carries a signal. Names carry a signal. Even why you think you want to wear a certain designer's clothes? Because you want to wear their name because their name means success. So you want to have on the latest designer because now you feel successful by the very name of the designer. Why you think everybody want to say that's Beyonce or that's a Puff Daddy? And Puff Daddy kept changing his name to Puff Daddy. Well, whose name is Puff Daddy? See? But what's his real name? Very key. And all these mindsets. And before you know it, you'll take on different personalities. Or your children will have different personalities. Because you gave them a name that come from some, uh, 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 some ancient uh, uh, Egyptian. And don't even know the spirit behind it. Okay? I was one who studied for about 10 years, maybe more, just the power of names in the Bible. What names mean? Even, even when it comes to spirituality, we'll say it's called Ichabod. What is Ichabod? Ichabod means the glory has departed. What do Kabod mean? The word Kabod means glory. Ik is I. Whenever I is in front of God's glory, it's Ichabod. It leaves. See, it's a name. People now, some people don't even want to say the name of Jesus. They'll say his name is Yeshua because that's not his original name in the Hebrew. Names are important. We argue over God's name. Is it Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisa, Jehovah Salon, El Shaddai? All these different names. And God introduces himself in the beginning God. In the beginning, Elohim. It's the plural form of God. Knowing his name. When you cast out, you cast out demons in his name. You cast out demons by the authority of his nature that's been, give, been given to you. So sometimes you operate from a wrong power or a wrong authority. Your son can't be the person he need to be because he got a name on him that keeps him in captivity. 
See? Even names as if crazy. Oh, he crazy. He done lost his mind. That can tax to you. That's why I don't like people when we address people. Oh, he's a homosexual. Oh, he's gay. You put a name on him. And there's some people that we put a name on them. That's not even their lifestyle. They have never practiced homosexuality, but we lay with them. And now you can't see who they are by the name that has been given to them. This is important. Okay. And it, it, it can damage destiny in raising stars by the name you put on. Something so simple as by, by the way they address themselves. Okay. Oh my God. I got five more minutes. Okay. You have to teach your children to have a love for God, not a love for gold. Listen, one of the strongest entities that will, will snatch your children out of destiny is the power of money. The power of money has purchased so many people. The Bible says, what do a profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? If it says, what does a profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? It's saying that you could sell your soul for gaining the whole world. Jesus Christ, when he was tempted by the devil, one of the temptations was, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world if you bow down and worship me. If the devil had enough ner nerve to offer kingdoms to, the, to Jesus Christ himself, who he knew was God, who he knew was God, then what do you think he going to offer you? And when you, don't, when you teach your children to be driven by gold... When you teach your children that gold is their security, if they have enough money in the bank, they're secure, then you're fooling them. Because I'm telling you, the government is going to shut banks down. They had a thing on the news yesterday, all these different restaurants that were being shut down because of the, the government took away how much people can write off. These business owners and these, these uh, movie stars who can come in and filmmakers, they was able to have so much budget to write off, billions of dollars to write off. And the government shut off them writing. And when they shut off them from giving the right to write off billions of dollars, it affected the restaurants. And then their business, then they had to shut down different businesses. So security cannot be in anything outside of God. Your only safety is in the will of God for your life. There is no recession in heaven, but you got to make sure that you don't put your trust with what, what Russ and Moth does be corrupt. But you got to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But you can't raise your children to be driven by gold because they'll shoot somebody over a gold chain. See, when you raise enough stars, you make sure you teach your children where value should where, where value should be and what honor should be. But if you raise them to be gold conscious, image conscious, fashion conscious, all of a sudden they'll take somebody else's kids' tennis shoe. They'll steal somebody else's car and bike because they're gold driven. See, they're not God driven. And you got to put that in your children at a young age that God is your security and God has given you a purpose and every purpose has a vision and every vision has a provision and God will provide for the vision he gave you according to your purpose. All preaching now, this is essential. But you'd be surprised we're driven by goals, we're driven by uh, Mercedes Benz, we're driven by, and nothing wrong with nice things. But you should, you should drive the car, not the car drive you. You you should you should have you should have the clothes on, not the clothes have you. Okay, it's not what you drive; it's what's driving you. Uh oh, uh oh, where well, your real passion is. See, so so a lot of people are turning their back on God, have exchanged God for gold, have exchanged God for glitter, and have exchanged God for girls. Oh yeah, gold, glitter. And girls have taken away great men of God, great women of God, because we're caught up into it. You got to teach them to have a love for God. God is your security. Woo! Okay? God has a, has a vision for you, and every vision there is a provision. You got to teach them that. Okay? Because they're driven by it. You got to look your, look, your, look your children in the eyes and tell them that you love them. Now, listen, I'm going to give you a powerful, practical to. This is like a like a, like a test to see where your children real God esteem should be. Look your children in the eyes, whether they're male or female, and say, "I love you," and see what you see in their eyes when you tell them you love them. And then next time you're able to give them a pair of tennis shoes, you're able to buy a jacket, you're able to take them to the movies. Look in their eyes when you give them a gift, and see what brings the greater expression did you hear me 
You don't want a gift that you gave to your children to put more gleam in their eyes than they do when mama coming home from work, working hard to pay bills, and they don't have a gleam in their eye for mama. Because that means their perception has been turned. It's not, it's not accurate. Are you hearing me? I look kids in the eyes. I look them in the eyes when they're being whooped. How they really deal with love that brings chastisement. See? I want them to know that daddy loves them. Mama loves them. So there's a look in their eyes you should see. See? When you give them gifts versus you saying, I love you. When you hug them. Pay attention because you're raising stars. And if not, you can be raising you can be raising a child to have a love for gold, a love a love for fashion, a love for for ego, and you don't even know you've been raising them because you never looked into the eyes, the eyes of the windows of your soul, and see where their real desire is, where their real attraction is, what really means most to them. We got a grandson here that every time my wife comes home, you can look in his eyes; he has so much love for her. It's amazing, and that's where it should be. And you know what? When she blesses him with a gift and gives him something, he's so excited and he's so thankful. But his thankfulness and his excited is coming from not from what he's getting, but who he's getting it from. When you raise up stars, you teach them to be excited about their gifts because it came from the lover of their soul. It came from God. See? It's offensive to give somebody a gift and you know that they're more in love with the gift than they are you. But when you understand that they're excited about the gift because you took out the time to give it to me. You spent your money to do it. You thought enough about me. And that's how you raise stars. That God, that God considers me so he gave me a vision. God didn't leave me to myself to wonder how I, I can take care of myself and my family. He loves me enough. So I love when God gave me a promotion. I love when God elevated me. I love when God made a way out of no way because I'm in love with God. That's how you raise stars. That the priority of their love is in order. Our love is out of priority a lot of times. And we raise children to be gold takers. To be gold drivers. Because we didn't push God enough. Woo! Are you hearing me? This is essential. Love for God and not gold, not glitter and not girls. Very key. Okay. I'm past my time. Um. I'll stop there because I want to take a lot of time on the next point. Father, we thank you for your anointing. Thank you for clarity. Thank you for simplicity today. I felt simplicity. And I bless your name for it. Somebody is about to be elevated. You're being watched. And this goes for me as well. God is elevating you. He's elevating you. Um, you almost lost your dream and God is drifting you back. And, and by you coming back and, 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 and revisiting some thoughts and you're revisiting some promises, um, you're going to see God move on your behalf. I'm telling you, it's not long. Within days, you're going to begin to see this thing rise up. If you haven't already saw it, okay? God is doing something. Uh, stars are, 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 are lights that are bright and up. When you look at a star... It's, 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 it's millions of miles away. It looks small, not because it's small. Some scientists say that every star is a galaxy. So when you understand you're raising stars, you're raising galaxies. They look far, they look small from a distance, but they're large. Never, never believe that what God has given you to raise or to be is small. It's large. The closer you get to it, the more you'll see how huge God has trusted you. He trusted you with a huge responsibility. He trusted you with a huge obligation. He trusted you with a huge opportunity. So I'm telling you a word of knowledge that your elevation has come and God is elevating you. A star could fall million years ahead of us and we won't see it until a million years later. Because it's traveling through space. You have to understand the space, the space that has designed for what God has given you. It's huge. I'll give you an example and I got to go. 
Uh, I know people enjoy my teaching. I know the anointing that's on my life. I know the insight and the wisdom that God has given me. But the truth of the matter is, the real truth of the matter is, I really don't even have a clue how large it is. As much as I do know, it's just a million times greater than what I don't know. But I do know that it's that large, even though I don't even know what I know, but I know it. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? I know it. It's, it's that huge. I, I, I know it to the point that I don't really know how many, how, I know that people have, have, have a, experienced a real impact in their lives because of what God released out of my mouth. But even though I know that, it's so much of impact they couldn't even tell me. That's what I'm trying to tell you. To the point that it'll be 100 and 200 years from now and people will be watching this very take that I'm saying. And people will be listening to this tape. We don't know what time it's going to be and how it's going to be. And they'll be saying, my God, when, when did he say this? I, I, there's a book that I read by, by a guy and he, he died in the 1600s. And I'm reading some of his stuff that he said. And I, if, if, and I don't swear, but if I could swear, I would say, my God, he had to just preach this last week. How can you be that accurate? Because that's how big the story is. That's how huge the layers are. See? So welcome back. And watch, watch how big God began to show you what's in you that you thought was just a little star so, so far away. Okay, we're called the Ray Stars. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. We'll do a part five. We'll end up in the last three points and we'll go from there. I love you. God bless you. Pray for me and my wife. And I say this, learn to celebrate who God has given you. Learn to celebrate. If God bless you with a wonderful wife, celebrate her. If God has blessed you with a wonderful husband, celebrate him. If God has blessed you with wonderful children, celebrate the stars. When even the wise men in the Bible, who may not have been saved, they was astrologers, they studied stars, but they knew that the bright star had come to the world. And even they came to celebrate who Jesus was. They celebrate Jesus in the manger, knowing that he was going to become the savior. They didn't wait before he, they didn't wait for him to become the savior to give him his, his, his respect and his honor. They did it as a baby. When you, when you understand stars, you can celebrate the beauty of who they are even when they are in their infant stage, even when they haven't learned everything yet, even when they're still growing. Learn to celebrate the baby. The baby. Learn to celebrate. Learn, and I even speak this to you. Learn to celebrate your baby steps. You're a star, but you're making baby steps. You may be in a manger. Nobody really knows you, but you got to know, celebrate the small, the small loan. Celebrate you was able to save just a little money on the side. Learn to celebrate each step because that's called raising stars. You know, when, when they crossed the Red Sea, that they made a marker in, they, in every step and they would stop and get the tambourines and they would mark the place. Where God delivered them from? When you're raising stars, you know how to celebrate. You got an A today, son. You pass fifth grade. You celebrate fifth grade. You, you, celebrate, you celebrate that first step. You celebrate it. Because you know how this is how you raise stars. And, I, and God just gave me that just now. A lot of times in raising stars, there's not enough celebration. There's too much being critical and not enough celebration. Celebrate the good times in the marriage. Celebrate the good times in the friendship. Because you're raising something that is beyond your imagination. You have no idea where this is going to take you. Okay? God bless you. I love you. Pray for me and my wife. Enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll see you tomorrow. Point... Part five on raising stars in the kingdom.